Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here, and it's honored to be here at this conference for Tom. Um, of course, watching Tom, like Tom's work has been very influential, and talking to Tom has been great for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, Tom's talks have been very influential, so I've gotten to see a number of them over the years. I, I think I remember one of the first ones that I went to, I thought it was at Louis, in Louisiana, but Lenny tells me it was at, Georgia, at uh, UGA, at the Georgia Topology Conference, so I'm sure he's right. And uh, Tom had just proved something great. I actually don't remember which great thing. Maybe it was property P or some other, I mean, you know, perfect. The, uh, it's hard to remember which great theorem. We have too many great theorems. But, so I was really excited to go to the talk, and uh, lots of people there, and so on. And, and Tom got up to speak, and he started showing his slides. And he chose a somewhat unusual color theme. Um, I thought I would do that in honor of his, his birthday. So, um, ah, it's not working. Hang on. There we go. <laughs> so the whole talk looked sort of like this, which, well, you could understand what he was saying. Um, but it was a little bit difficult to read the text. Um, so uh, let me talk about this slide for a little bit. OK, so here's the plan for the talk. Um, well, I'm going to give you the statement of the theorem. Then I'll talk about the proof of the theorem. And then I'll talk about some applications of the theorem. Um, the, some of the transition pictures. If you guys don't know, there's this uh, website, Unsplash, that has free stock photos. So if you ever need stock photos for teaching or something, it's really nice. Um, and I don't know whether at the end I'll be able to convince you that the theorem itself is interesting, but I hope that I'll at least convince you it's related to lots of interesting stuff. So the talk's a little bit more colloquium style than, than some of the others. OK, so uh, statement of the theorem. Uh, so I should start by telling you what a strongly invertible knot is. So a strongly invertible knot is a knot which is preserved by rotation around an axis that intersects it in two points. So um, let's see if the movie will work over this. So here's a knot in the middle. And um, OK, well, sort of works. If you rotate it by pi, it gets back to itself. So that's done two of the pi rotations. And if you have a strongly invertible knot, there are two natural um, diagrams to look at there. So you can look at a projection to a plane so that the axis projects to a line. Okay, so the axis basically lies in the projection plane. Or you can look at once the axis projects to a point. Um, and the, uh, you know, OK, the, but you still, see the, you still see the symmetry. So not symmetric around rotation around the point. So um, if you look at the axis, the one where the, the uh, axis projects to a line, the knot rotates transversely to the plane. So, uh, the terminology is by Keegan Boyle, but he called this a transvergent projection, and the one where it rotates in the plane is introvergent. Okay, and the, both will come up a little bit in the talk. Um, okay, so just th there are those, uh, for those diagrams again. So on the left, we have the uh, transvergent diagram. The rotation is transverse the plane, and on the right, we have the introvergent diagram, introvergent and transvergent. Okay, so... Given a knot, so a strongly invertible knot, we'll keep playing with this one. Um, there's an associated, uh, well, okay, there's a choice of half axis. So here I've chosen the sort of middle part of the half axis. There's what they called a uh, butterfly link. So this is in the introduction of paper boil. Isa, and I'll say at the end of the, the, later in the talk, what they were doing with this construction. But you can take the, the places that the knot intersects the axis and connect them up by a band. Okay, so just connect a band there. Um, with some number of twists so that you get a link. Okay. So uh, if you want to pin down exactly which link, and, and they did, though it's not important for the theorem I'm going to give you, um, you can just require that the linking number of the two components is 0. So here the, there's a blue component and a yellow component. And I've rigged up the number of twists on the axis, so the linking number is 0. Um, I should have said, feel free to interrupt with questions. It's supposed to be sort of understandable. Um, of course, it's hard to interrupt during a uh, slide talk, but still. OK, if you take the quotient, then um, you get a knot. So this is the quotient of that. We just kept, say, the yellow part, and then it gets connected up on the left side, yeah, outside the fundamental domain. Um, and the quotient lives in an annulus because there was still this axis. OK, it intersected the knot there, but now it's disjoint from this link, and so it descends to a 
um, and axis disjoint from the quotient knot. So the quotient naturally lives in an annulus. Um, okay. You can do the same thing in the intravergent diagram. So uh, there, what this uh, taking the butterfly link corresponds to is you take a resolution of the middle crossing, the crossing that intersected the axis of symmetry. And um, really, I should have put in, I think I acknowledge that there, really I should have put in some number of twists in the middle to get the blue and yellow to have linking number zero. They don't, but the picture was already so complicated I didn't want to make it worse. And then again, it has a quotient. So there's the quotient drawn in the introvergent diagram. And the number of twists you put in the middle to get it to have link number zero will affect how many times it winds around the, the axis there. Um, of course, in this picture, you might as well do the other resolution also. The other resolution gives you a knot. That's why there's only one color. Um, and the quotient is the same knot. So this quotient with the other resolution is the same knot, but the axis lives in a different place. So you'll notice that this part of the of the quotient moved across the axis there. Uh, great. So here's a theorem. Um, I, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to tell you what the, some of the notation of the theorem means. But the theorem is that given a strongly invertible knot, there's a spectral sequence starting from the Kavanaugh homology of the knot, OK, blown up by a factor of uh, polynom uh, Laurent polynomials converging to um, the kernel mod co-kernel, sorry, kernel plus co-kernel of a map F plus from the annular Kavanaugh homology of K1 to the annular Kavanaugh homology of K0. So the map that the uh, map on annular Kavanaugh homology is there. OK, I'll tell you what, remind you what annular Kavanaugh homology is on the next slide, and I'll tell you what the map F plus is on the next slide or the slide after. Um, just uh, before that, just some, some words about conventions. So uh, I'll say this again on the next slide, but my convention is that Kavanaugh homology, the differential goes from the one resolution to the zero resolution. And um, almost everything is with F2 coefficients. So like, the reason I can tensor over F2 is because that was secretly Kavanaugh homology with F2 coefficients. OK. Yeah. Co I mean, you mean geometrically. Yeah. Not as far as I know, but that's a good question. So I will tell you what the map F plus is, and then at the end I'll ask what this means. Yeah, good question. So I should repeat the question. The question was, what does the cone mean? What, what, is, this, what is this cone, uh, you know, in terms of other more familiar things? Uh, let me tell you what it is. Well, let me remind you what annular Kavanaugh homology is and tell you what the cone is just sort of literally. It means... Well, stay tuned for two slides. Uh, so just a reminder about Kavanaugh homology itself, um, though most of the audience knows this. You start with a Kavanaugh homology, you start with a knot diagram. OK, there's one of my favorite knots. Um, you look at all of the ways of resolving the crossings. You can do a 0 or 1 resolution at each crossing. That gives you a cube of resolutions. OK, so here are two crossings, two-dimensional cube. Um, each edge in the cube is associated to a cobordism, which either either two uh, circles merge, or one circle splits into two. Okay, so there's a cube of, of cobordisms, one plus one dimensional cobordisms. Um, now, there's a TQFT associated with this Frobenius algebra, which is z adjoint x1, x squared, and the co unit is that. Okay, so, what that means, and so I'm going to compose the, we had a map from the, the cube, so the cube is a uh, map from two to the end. That's just a, uh, just mean the category of that's how it's shaped the cube to cobordism and composed with TQFT, you get a cube of abelian groups. What that means is you replace each circle by a copy of this ring A, and any time two circles merged, you applied the multiplication. Any time a circle split, you apply the co-multiplication. Um, and you take the total complex of that, and you take homology. Uh, so that you collapse it that way, and you take homology. OK. Um, annular Kavanaugh homology is the same. Except with an extra, you take, there's an extra filtration, you take the associated graded. So um, suppose that I started with this annular knot on the left. So that's got a, the annulus is right in the middle of the left circle. Um, OK, and I look at this cube of resolutions. Well, there's a hole is inside one of the circles in each place. 
Now, assign a winding number to each of the, the circles, either plus one or minus one, or zero. Zero if it doesn't go around the, uh, the hole, and one if it goes around, sorry, one if it's labeled one, and x if it's, uh, sorry, and minus one is labeled x. So here, this circle is goes around is labeled one, so it has winding number one, goes around positively. This one's labeled x, it's got winding number minus one, goes around negatively. It's not hard to see, or hard to show, that that gives a filtration on the Kavanaugh uh, cube. So every differential either preserves or decreases the winding number. Every term of the differential either preserves or decreases this winding number. So in this example, the arrow in black preserves the winding number, and the two in red decrease the winding number. And you throw away all of the differentials that decrease it. You take the associated graded, and then you take, so that means throw away all of the differentials that decrease it, and then you take homology. And that's the annular Kavanaugh homology. Uh, they're not oriented. Good question. So the circles and cubes are not oriented. So what is, what's up with the orientations here? I orient it counterclockwise if it's labeled 1 and clockwise if it's labeled x. So it's the, it's the Kavanov generator that's determining the orientation. Thanks, John. M more questions? Yeah, you can, so you can do it with more dots. There's a recent paper working out sort of the details of that theory by a student of Petkova's, whose name I'm blocking. But it works out the way you expect. So you have a filtration by z to the n, say, and, and it works out how you expect. Well, you, you have a, I mean, once you have, so you, if you put in more dots, you get a filtration from, e, you know, from each dot, and that gives you z to the n. You can collapse it just to a single filtration if you want, and... Well, it'll be an invariant of the, so what's an invariant of? It's an invariant of the not in the n times punctured plane. So, and, and that's actually, I, I mean, mostly that's a special case. The, the original constructions, I just didn't give an attribution. So this originally appeared in the work of Asaeda, Prushtitsky, and Sikora, and they looked at knots in uh, thickened surfaces, any I bundle over a surface so that the total space is orientable. And this is the case of the surface is just an annulus, okay. But you could take the surface to be a, uh, uh, you know, n times punctured plane, and, and the construction goes through. Uh, they, their filtration is a little bit more complicated in that case than the one I just said, but it's close. Yeah. More questions. Right. I didn't attribute Kavanaugh homology either. It's due to Kavanaugh. Um, okay. I, there was one more piece of notation in the theorem. I haven't told you what it is, so let me tell you about F plus, this map F plus. So my two different resolution, my two different quotients, they just differed by moving part of the knot um, over the base point. So I need a map that moves part of the knot over the base point. Okay, so here's how that works. Um, it's a composition of two maps. You give birth to an unknot labeled one that goes around the, the axis. And then you merge that unknot with, the, um, with the, the knot. So you do the annular Kavanaugh merge map. And so the composition of those two maps is this, uh, is this map F plus. I claim to have explained that. Questions about that? Danny. Oh, great. Yeah, so this map is associated to moving, this F plus is associated to moving this strand uh, like this little piece of the diagram across the base point. So there's a like mark point coming from where, which piece of the diagram moved across the base point. You didn't, yeah. There'd be an, that's right. So F plus is depending on like. That's right. To a different target. That's right. That's right. Good question. Um, so this is not the first time these maps appeared in the literature. Um, there's some. There's a paper of Achmachet and. Kavana from not that long ago, 2020-ish, that introduces a family of cobordisms for uh, annular Kavana homology that allows the cobordisms to move through the axis. Um, but then they, they keep track of the points where the cobordism intersects the axis, and they're labeled one or two. So each of those points is labeled one or two. And they have some of these, uh, it's modular sum relations. And this, so what they were doing, so I'm, I was going to say less, but they, they were doing, um, they want to sort of 
foam style construction of annular Kavana homology, and this was the input, and they did it also for the SL3 case. Uh, and so this is, there's an obvious cavortism here, which is you just, I mean, going from there to there, which is you move the knot across the base point. And this is the map associated to it. And the reason it factors is this composition is, is because you can factor that cavortism as a, you know, a cup like that and then a saddle, which is what we did here. So this doesn't really answer Tom's question in the sense of I haven't identified with something that was familiar to you unless you read the Akhmachek Kavanov, but it identifies at least with this, con this construction there. Um, okay, so since we, I just thought I would put in the main theorem and also put in the gradings, but since we have all the notations. So this is the theorem you saw before, except that I uh, stuck the, uh, the way it affects the gradings. So um, it does violence to the, to the homological grading, so you just sum over all homological gradings, but then the quantum grading gets mixed up with the annual, the k is the winding number around the axis, and they get mixed up in a sort of controlled way. Um, it doesn't matter, I mean, uh, it's gonna come up at one point later exactly what the gradings did, but, uh, but I would ignore it for a first pass. Um, right. You know, this is the best I could get Microsoft uh, PowerPoint's equation editor to do with a big O plus with subscripts. But that's a feature, not a bug. It encourages you not to type a bunch of mathematics on the slides. Nobody wants to see slides with a bunch of mathematics. Yeah. Say, sorry, say it louder. I still didn't hear you. Why not humor? Beamer. Beamer. Oh, because Beamer encourages you to type a lot of mathematics. <laughs> In Beamer, it's really easy to type lots of formulas. Um, okay, so uh, let me say something about the, the heritage of this, of this result, where it comes from. So the first result of this kind is due to Zeidel and Smith um, from 2006. Uh, and they studied um, the case of two periodic knots, and they used symplectic Kavanaugh homology, so this uh, Fleur homological definition due to Zeidel and Smith of Kavanaugh homology. And they show there's a similar spectral sequence um, in the two periodic case. That means here there's a symmetry around an axis which is disjoint from the knots. So if you had a, the axis is there and rotation by 180 degrees is, is uh, a symmetry and there's the quotient. Um, uh, great. Um, so the way they prove this is, well, you uh, show that if there's a Z2 action on a symplectic manifold, uh, preserving some Lagrangian setwise, then there's a spectral sequence relating, I mean, there should be these F2 brackets thetas, uh, theta, theta inverse is fine. The equivariant Fleur homology in the total space and the ordinary Fleur homology in the fixed set. Um, so this is a sort of, symplectic or, or Lagrangian Fleur analog of something classical that I'll say a few words about later in the talk, uh, also called Smith theory, but due to P.A. Smith from the 1930s. Um, okay, uh, they proved it under quite, I should have said, they proved this under, this holds under quite restrictive hypotheses. So most Lagrangian intersection problems this doesn't hold for. Um, and then this was used by Kristen Hendricks to give a number of results um, for Hagar Fleur homology, including some results about periodic, uh, not Fleur homology of periodic knots and um, uh, Fleur homology of branch covers. Then much, some, much more recently, 2019-ish, Tim Large gave a fancier version, an improved version of the Zeidel Smith theorem um, with weaker hypotheses, and then some more applications to Hagar Fleur homology. Um, and that uses ideas of, of uh, Kronheimer and Rufka, so that's nice for this talk. Um, and in fact, you could ask, well, is there a version in Hagard Fleur homology of the main theorem? And the answer is yes, and that follows from a paper with Kristen and Ty, but using the result, the key input is the result of Tim Lodge. So there is an analog of, of the main theorem from this talk for, for Hagard Fleur homology because of this theorem of Tim's. I'm not going to say state the version of the theorem precisely. Um, the second sort of strain of thought that, that uh, was important in, in getting to this theorem is due to uh, Ty Lidman and Ciprian. Um, so they showed for monopole Fleur homology that um, if you have a regular p-fold cover, then there's a spectral sequence relating the monopole Fleur homology upstairs and the monopole Fleur homology downstairs. This is the 
non-equivariant version of the monopole Fleur homology. So that's the analog of HF hat in Hagard Fleur homology. Um, how do they do that? Well, um, I didn't say. Uh, maybe I'll say in a sec. Uh, maybe I won't say in a sec. Let me say just in case I don't say in a sec. Sorry. So um, how do they do this? They constructed a space who's, I mean, Chipran constructed a space whose homology is this monopole Fleur homology, ordinary homology is monopole Fleur homology. And then the tie in Chipran showed that this is a fixed set of an action, this, the space giving this homology is a fixed set of an action on the space giving that homology. And then they applied classical Smith theory. So um, this went through using this uh, Fleur stable homotopy type. Um, Stoffigan and Zhang applied the same idea, but for Kavanov homology. So they got, there's a result for, uh, this is for periodic knot. So again, this sort of symmetry that's destroyed from the axis. Um, and there's again a rank inequality. I have not, by the way, I have not listed, you might think that by this point of the slide, I'm listing all possible results of this form that I mean, oh no. No, it's okay. Got it. Oh, sad. Hang on. Play from current slide. So much for having cues. Uh, zoom. Apparently, <laughs> it's karma. Uh, oh, no, I have to click through the whole slide again. OK, um, I haven't listed all. There are a bunch of other results of this form I didn't list. OK, uh, so this was reproved from a different perspective um, by another group. Uh, their theorem, or at least the key lemmas in proving the theorem, an input to, to the theorem that I'm going to give you. So this is not, I mean, ours is not independent from theirs. Ours uh, uses their ideas. Um, oh, the last thing I wanted to mention for context is that there's already work on Kavanaugh homology for strongly invertible links. In particular, um, Andrew Lobb and Liam Watson defined an equivariant Kavanaugh homology, but using the other kind of diagram, not this kind of diagram, the other one. I'll come back to say something about that at the end. OK. This, by the way, is the, if you type in proofs in PowerPoint, this is the image that PowerPoint comes up with. Um, huh? Yeah, I don't know, I sort of like hopscotch, you know, you, OK, sorry. Um, OK, I want to try to convince you that the theorem is basically obvious, the main theorem, at least that it's almost basically obvious. So here's the main theorem again. Uh, how do we get it? So the symmetry of K, that's this, the, we have this rotation around the points in the middle, um, induces a map on Kavanov complexes. So I'll just call that also tau from the, just by the obvious thing. It takes a resolution to resolution and generators to generators. Okay. Um, so now you can consider the bi-complex given by, uh, well, this. You take the Kavanov comp, infinitely many copies of the Kavanov complex, so there's a vertical differential here, you know, a differential inside each of these terms, and connect them by uh, differential of the form identity plus tau. I think I learned this construction from Chipriano a long time ago. Um, so this is a way, this is one way of defining or computing the equivariant homology of a chain complex. If you have any chain complex with a Z2 action, you can write down this complex, and that's a version of the equivariant homology. If you start with the singular chains on a space, this gives you the equivariant, Pharrell equivariant homology um, after inverting theta. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. I should have attributed to myself that point here. I mean, so sorry. So this uses the, the lipschitz sharkar kavanov stable homotopy type is how this theorem is proved. And that's going to come up next. Yeah, sorry. Sorry? Why do I, so why do I, why are I boring you with this? I, bear with me. I'll come back to the other thing. Um, I, You see, well, here's the point. 
I want to almost convince you that our theorem is a corollary of this theorem. And I want to, I want to tell you why our theorem is not quite a corollary, but almost of that theorem. So like, is it actually new? I don't know what that is as a spectrum. That's right. I mean, I do, but, but you haven't been told yet. I have written that up. I haven't written it up on this slide. <laughs> I should have said this paper's on the archive. So like, if you, don't, if you want any details, it's available. Um, so OK, we have the spy comments. I take the homology of each of the um, CKHs. That gives me a spectral sequence. And the, so that is filtered by how far along you are horizontally. That gives you a spectral sequence. The E uh, one page is the Kavanaugh homology tends to with F2 is joint theta theta inverse. So that's the E one page that I want up here. OK, that's my E one page that I wanted here. And so if I could figure out what the E infinity page, if I showed the infinity page was this, I would be done. Or if I knew what the infinity page was, I would be done. Um, OK, so if I take the um, homology first the other way, so filter by the grading on each of the individual terms, so that the first differential is the horizontal maps, um, it's not hard to see that the E3 page is the right-hand side here. I'm going to basically do that argument in a slightly disguised form in a couple of slides. And so the question is, um, does this other spectral sequence, why don't you take the horizontal differentials first, does it collapse? Okay. Well, so I'm... You know, this is just repeating what we had at the end of the last slide. I ran out of space. Um, so the Kavanaugh complex is the mapping cone of a map from K1 to K0. That's just the skein, you know, the unoriented skein relation at the middle crossing. And Stoffer and Zhang showed that each of K0 and K1 are periodic knots. So we already know what the, that there's a spectral sequence that's formed from Stoffer and Zhang. So, OK, if we plug that in, I sped, sped up, you see, because Tom was bored. If we plug that in to each vertex, I, get, I see that our bicomplex looks like this. And if I restrict to the top row or the bottom row, it follows from Stoffer and Zhang that this spectral sequence that I wanted to collapse collapses. But I couldn't figure out, or we couldn't figure out how to rule out having some higher differential in the spectral sequence that relate the two rows, sort of go from the bottom to the top or something. So, this almost gets you a proof, but doesn't quite at the last step, because there could be some annoying differential coming from the fact that it was, you know, that it intertwines the two rows. Too bad. OK, so back to the drawing, drawing board. So I'm going to um, tell you where the Stoffer and Zhang spectral sequence came from. So um, let's recall something classical. So this is going back to the 1930s again, 30s, early 40s. Um, so Stoffer and Chang deduced the localization theorem from classical Smith theory for ZP spaces. Um, that's what uh, Ty and Chipperen did also. Um, so I need a word. A Z2 CW complex is a CW complex with a particularly nice kind of action. It's cellular, takes cells to cells, and um, on each open, so the fixed set is a union of, of open cells. So each cell is either fixed by tau or it, two different cells, or cells are permuted by tau. But you can't have just some piece of a cell fixed by the involution. OK. So um, here's a Z2 space. And there's a, uh, so it's a sphere, right? And it has an action. OK, the action is not looking that good. Well, it looks fine on my computer. That's a zoom problem. Um, OK, so what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to make it into a cell complex. So now my, my space has become a cell complex. I triangulated it. And the Z2 action um, takes cells to cells, right? I went around. It's happening twice here. But you went around. Each cell is taken to a new cell. Um, so given a finite uh, Z2 CW complex, you can form this complex that I said before, this equivariant complex using the cellular chain complex. Um, let's think about what happens with the, what the, happens if I do the horizontal differentials first spectral sequence. So the kernel of the horizontal differential, um, the two kinds of uh, things in it. If I had a cell that was fixed by tau, then id plus tau of it is 0. Again, everything's with F2 coefficients, right? So for example, the cells at the bottom and the top, this, is, this vertex is fixed by tau, so id plus tau of it is 0. Um, 
If you have a pair of cells that are exchanged by tau, like the front and the back, then um, id plus tau of the sum is zero. Uh, the first kind, this ones are not in the image. So this, this cell is not in the image of id plus tau, but that, of course, is id plus tau of the front triangle. Okay, so I take homology of that. The E1 page um, of this so I say the spectral sequence is um, just the cellular chains on the fixed set because all I was left with was these cells that were fixed by tau. And you can see that the differential is the differential on the cellular chains of fixed set. That uses this GCW complex property. Um, and uh, fine, the fixed cells, however, span a subcomplex, so there are no terms of the differential out of it. If you think about what's the, what is the differential in a, the, what are the next differentials in, a, in the spectral sequence, they're like zigzags. But since there are no differentials that go from a fixed generator to a non-fixed generator by a property being GCW complex, Z2CW complex, um, there are no zigzags. So there are no higher differentials. The spectral sequence collapses, and you get the result. Um, OK, so there's the sort of classical story that shows that you get uh, spectral sequence from the homology of x to the homology of the fixed set. Um, finite is important in order to know that the two spectral sequences converge to the same thing. Otherwise, I mean, this is extremely, so exercise, the statement is completely false if you drop finite from CW complex. OK. Um, the other ingredient we need was Kavanov space. Let me tell you something about the, the Kavanov space that Tom kindly reminded me exists. So, um, uh, so given a link diagram, I can build for you a CW complex whose homology is Kavanov homology. And the stable homotopy type of the CW complex is an invariant. So that doesn't matter for this talk at all. But uh, how does that construction work? So I need an intermediate, I mean, there are two versions of the construction, but the one I want to give, I need an intermediate notion, which is this category B. This is the Burnside category of the trivial group, Burnside 2 category of the trivial group. But let me tell you concretely what it is. The objects are sets. The morphisms are correspondences, so it's just a set mapping to x and y. So this is a one morphism in the category. It's just a set mapping to x and y. This is a map from x to y. It's like if you've seen Lagrangian correspondences, it's just like that, except not in Lagrangian. Um, okay. uh, whoops, sorry. And the, the two morphisms are bijections of correspondences, so maps from this to some other one that commute with the structure maps. A correspondence is like a matrix of sets. So it's like a y by x matrix of sets. Um, OK. So what we construct is I'm going to construct a map from the cube to 1 plus 1 embedded cobordisms. It turns out that it uses the way these cobordisms are embedded in, in uh, R3 cross I, R2 cross I, um, to the Burnside category and then um, from the Burnside category spectrum. So I need to explain, well, this arrow I explained previously, given a knot diagram, I think I stuck it there. Given a knot diagram, you get a uh, cube of cobordisms. OK, there. Um, I need to explain the other two, so let me do that. So um, this map, the Burnside category, I need to tell you what correspondence there is associated to each um, edge, so to each of the, or to each composition of edges, so to each map in this, each cobordism, I need to tell you what's the correspondence. Okay? If the cobordism has genus zero, then the correspondence either is empty or has a single element, and it's just recording whether there's a term of the Kavanov differential or not. Okay, so for, for genus zero correspondences, it's either empty or has one element, then all one element sets are the same. So it doesn't matter what set it is there. Um, if it's got genus bigger than uh, one, there is only, there are no L, it's empty. The correspondence is empty. Okay. Um, and if it's got genus one, the correspondence has two elements. And they correspond to what? You do a checkerboard coloring of the complement of the the checkerboard coloring of the, the complement of the correspondence. So here I've, my checkerboard is white and um, sparkly uh, purple. Okay. You look at the white region. H1 of the white region, well, actually, H1 of the white region is sort of big, like there's a loop there and a loop there. But you look at H1 of the white region mod H1 of the boundary. That's one, that's one dimensional. So there are two generators, that one and that one. And that's the two elements of the correspondence. So again, the correspondence for, for a genus 1 cobordism has two elements, and they're the generators of h1 of the white region mod h1 of the white region of the boundary. 
Uh, it doesn't matter so much for what I'm going to say, but I thought I would give you a, something like a complete definition. Then I need to tell you how you compose, like we compose two genus zero things, get a genus one thing, how to, what element of the correspondence you get. I'm not going to tell you. So there's something about composition that I'm suppressing. But um, roughly that's the definition of this functor B. So this functor, sorry, from cobordisms to B. Oh, notice it used the embedding because I'm looking at the complement. Uh, just an aside so I can see Tom was already getting bored. Um, if you wanted to do something like Lie homology, which we would love to, you'd need some way of getting some sort, like if you want to extend the story, you'd want some sort of correspondences or something associated to higher genus cobordisms. You need to get rid of this, like, this is some sort of quotient that, that killed off some potentially interesting structure. And we don't know how to do that, but I could imagine that something from gauge theory or something else would construct that. So it might be interesting that if you could see this, these correspondences in some more, you know, some other way that might give a hint of how to generalize this, this story. Okay, back to the main talk. So next I need to tell you, given one of these things, uh, how do I get a map from this Burnside category to spectra? Well, um, what I'm going to do is, so to an object that's just a finite set, I'm just going to take a wedge sum of spheres. So the wedge sum over all elements is a set of the n sphere. So in this case, the two elements, so it's just a wedge sum of two spheres. So a correspondence, I'm going to produce a, so a correspondence has arrows this way, from the correspondence to x and y. I'm going to, the map from the correspondence to y gives me a map from this wedge of spheres to that wedge of spheres. Okay, so this arrow you understand. It's, you know, I have a wedge sum over a and a, do wedge sum over y and y, just, well, there's a map of index sets, so there's a map of wedge sums. The left one, I need to invert this arrow to get an arrow going that way, and that's a version of the Pontryag and Tom construction. So um, what do you do? Here are my spheres. So this is a, it's a, I've drawn it in a slightly funny way, but this is a two-sphere, and here's the other two-sphere. So this is this wedge sum, Sn wedge Sn. Um, and you embed the correspondence in it. So I embed A, B, and C in it, and thicken them up a little bit to be disks. Okay, so I've embedded A, B, and C in it so that A and B, which map to X, live in the sphere over X, and C, which map to X prime, lives in the sphere over X prime. And now you do a, a collapse map. Okay. So now I've gotten to this middle one, and then you do this fold map, which takes you to the right-hand side. So there was the, uh, there's the, uh, there was first that map and then that map. Questions? Yeah, I think I can do that. Let's see. Maybe. Yep. Yeah, should we go back? So I embedded, I took this correspondence, A, B, and C, and I embedded it in this wedge sum of spheres, so in the wedge sum over X and X of Sn. So e each of A, B, and C went to a point. A was that black point there, B is that black point there. Just, yeah, embed those points, somehow. And now you say, but Robert, what if you chose a different embedding? And you also say, but Robert, what was n? So n is some large number, and the space of embeddings is like n minus 2 connected, n minus 1, n minus 2 connected, something like that. So you make n big enough that it doesn't matter. And a cube is just, there are no arrows of length bigger than the number of crossings, and so if you chose capital N big enough, then it doesn't matter to get everything to be coherent. Yeah, good question. More questions? I need to pick it up. OK. Um, I need to pick it up a lot. Uh, OK, so this gives so, OK, so you do the whole thing equivariantly. Um, instead of embedding them, you embed them that you embed them equivariantly, you put an action on the spheres, and um, then the work is you have to identify the fixed set. So um, you identify the fixed set. So th this, this, there's sort of some subfunctor of this functor, the Burnside category that's fixed, and you see that the fixed set on the space is the space associated with the fixed points of this functor. And um, that's interesting and takes work, and that was done by Stoffergen and Cheng, and we just used that. Um, 
everything works the same. So strongly invertible case, it works the same. And the new work is you have to identify the fixed set. And if you look at it, that's where you see this map F plus, the end. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, applications and, and uh, related results. So um, I thought I would put in Tom's thesis brothers and cousins and so on. But I saw just put in his students, and it was already too big, almost too big to fit on a slide. So there's uh, Tom's descendants. Uh, let me tell you an application and then a couple of related things. So uh, here's a theorem that's not due to us, but I'll give you, I'll give you our proof. This, here are two slice disks. You do this band. After you do the band, you've got two unknots, and you fill them in with uh, two disks. Okay, so here's a slice disk. Here's another slice disk, the not 946. And these slice disks are not isotopic, uh, rel boundary. Proof, it's enough to see they induce different maps on Kavana homology. Okay. Um, the map associated to the right is the map associated to the left composed with the strong involution, the, sorry, with the strong inversion tau. Um, in the relative, relevant grading, you can see that our spectral sequence converges to zero. You look at the quotient, the quotient is not too big, it's not too small either, but it's not too big, and you just compute that F plus was an isomorphism, and so the spectral sequence converges to zero. Wonderful, there's only one, do you look at how the gradients behave, there's where the, sp the, where the interesting part is, the relevant part is, and that tells you there's no way for this stuff to die if you pay attention to gradients, except by dying by tau. It has to be that tau is non-trivial on this part. So for some basis, tau has that form. You mess around a little bit, uh, and you see that, okay, there's a box, Dean, and you look at the kernel as one-dimensional, and you multiply x, that gives you some element there. Um, and you, that element uh, is taken to, but to the same non-zero element by both of the two disks because of some property about cobordism. So there's no actual, there's no work here. There's just a little bit of messing around with formal properties. Um, so that, that tells you that, uh, that uh, uh, these two disks give you have different values in a tau. So the only work was you had to compute that F plus was an isomorphism. And any time, you know, two-dimensional and F plus was an isomorphism. So, that forced tau. OK, I went a little fast there. Um, I don't remember who proved this first. These are not topologically isotopic. You can distinguish them from the, using the Alexander module is also. So um, this is a smooth proof of, a, of something that's actually topologically true. OK, uh, this was proved. This is not the first Kavanaugh homology proof for this pair of disks. It was proved by direct computation by Sonberg Swan. Ours is in some sense easier because you don't have to find any cycles. You just compute some Kavanaugh, annular Kavanaugh group, and you see that it was zero, and therefore, the rest of the proof is formal. Um, let me tell you some relate, nice related results before I run out of time. So um, there are exotic disks, disks that are topologically isotopic but not smoothly isotopic and are distinguished by Kavanaugh homology. So um, this, is, this was proved by Hayden and Sundberg. This was originally that these, so these two disks, again, you do that, there's the two components. I'm not, you fill it with disks, are topologically but not smoothly isotopic, so they're exotic. A key ingredient to know that the topologically isotopic is a theorem of Conway and Powell that under some conditions uh, guarantees thing that disks are topologically isotopic or serves as topologically isotopic. Um, okay, you can also, I don't even want to say that, you can just get something of RP2, a case of RP2s. There's a beautiful theorem from this here. You can even do it with ciphered services. So this, uh, there are a pair of ciphered services. Here's one of them, which for the same knot, which are topologically isotopic in B4, but not smoothly isotopic. So that's a beautiful theorem of Hayden, Kim, Miller, Park, and Sundberg from uh, a couple of months ago. Um, that's also a beautiful picture of Hayden, uh, Kim, Miller, Park, and Sundberg from a couple of months ago. Okay. Um, and in case, all cases, these maps are, just, these are distinguished by the maps on Kavanaugh homology. So computers maps on Kavanaugh homology is interesting. Um, another question you can ask, so is how many, if you take two services, you can attach one handles to make them isotopic. And you can ask, do you ever need more than one one handle? Or how many one handles do you need to make your services isotopic? So two versions of that. Maybe for time, I won't say the difference. Um, but in a topological category, it was shown that you can, you sometimes need more than one one handle. You need an arbitrary number of one handles. Um, OK, by these people. Um, but you can ask, OK, what about, what about uh, smoothly? Are there ones that are topologically isotopic but need a large number of one handles? Um, well, one way of approaching this, there are lots of examples that seem to have a strong inversion. So um, you can use a strong inversion to say something about this. So using a sort of similar strategy to what I did in Kavanaugh homology before us, 
at least before you write anything down, Dimolic and Sovereign used Hagar for homology to give some, some uh, abstractions to, to disks being the same and bounds on the stabilization distance. So again, it's like the argument two slides ago that I rushed through. Um, and a very recent theory, uh, theorem of Gary Guth is that for any n, there are knots which are smooth, topologically isotopic, but they need n stabilizations to become smoothly isotopic. So that's a relative version of a very old question of, of walls that uh, is whether any pair of homeomorphic four manifolds become diffeomorphic after a single connects on with S2 cross S2. So um, this is the version for surfaces. And so we don't know. The question of walls is still open. Yeah. No, let me, yeah, I'll rush it. Yeah. The boundary is important. So it's for closed things, it's still open. That's right. Yeah, I think it's still, I think it's still open for closed things. I agree. The boundary plays absolutely. Everything I'm saying is for boundary. That's right. For open things, it's closed. But for closed things, it's open. <laughs> yeah. Um, last quick one. There's a concordance group of these things. And the concordance group are used to being abelian. Um, this is where the butterfly links came up, by the way, but I'm a little out of time. Um, but for the uh, invertible ones, the concordance group is non-abelian. So here are two different connected sums of these two knots at the bottom. And there's a recent theorem with Depriza, who I think is an Italian graduate student, who I haven't met, unfortunately, that these, huh? Undergrad, Italian undergrad, very good, that these, uh, that these, uh, this group is non-commutative. So, and that uses this notion of butterfly, butterfly links. Okay, I had some questions, but I won't tell them. And then I have an apology for having too many pictures. So, um, thanks very much for listening. Oh, so the question was, can I go back one slide? <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, fine. You guys can read. So I say, say it again. Yeah, that's a good question. So there is some work distinguishing strongly invertible knots by, we didn't try to do it. I mean, I'm sure that it distinguishes, that, they, that it distinguishes some. But um, Lobb and Watson did that using the other kind of diagram, so using this sort of diagram. One thing that's nice about this sort of diagram is it also works for links. You know, if you have a link where it intersects the axis in more than two points, it's obvious what to do here. There's a similar diagram. Here, you'd have a whole bunch of lines going all through that middle point. You'd have some sort of complicated bigger number of, of crossings, you know, like big, higher crossings. Um, anyway, yeah, so they, they give some very simple examples in their paper where it distinguishes some strong inversions. But uh, I don't have any sense of how good these invariants are. And also, I don't know if theirs is in any way related to ours. So I'm sure it does, but I haven't actually like, done a computation to see that. Say it, say it again. It, it, oh. Yeah, so Tom's comment, I guess, is isn't this cone the definition of the annular command homology of a knot that hits the axis? And the answer is um, maybe. I mean, yeah, you, you, you can define them to be any, like, no, I know. But, but yeah, it seems, I agree. This is kind of sort of saying it's like, the difference between be pushing it off one side and pushing it off the other side. So that's yeah, so what's happening in the picture. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So in some sense, this is the end of the kind of, I mean, In fact, we, in the paper, introduced notation. We call this AKH of, I don't know, K, where K is the knot that intersects the thing in one axis. So in one point. Well, yeah. Oh, uh, more questions. <laughs>